Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, uh, our guest today is Dolores Sorrentino Senebogan. Uh, did I pronounce the Senebogan part right? Senebogan, yeah, Senebogan. Okay, Senebogan, okay. I got the Sorrentino right. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you, uh, I'll break the rule. You're not supposed to introduce people by saying who they're related to. But, uh, uh, Dolores is the daughter of Tony and Ann Sorrentino. And for at least 50 years, uh, they were the uh, probably the royal couple of the uh, Italian American community. Uh, uh, Tony, executive director of the Joint Civic Committee, and uh, Anne uh, working very hard in the uh, women's division and uh, doing all sorts of, of things. They were a fantastic couple. Uh, in any case. Uh, 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 Dolores uh, is uh, their daughter, and Dolores uh, kept her mother's tradition going by uh, creating a, a book uh, uh, called uh, According to Anne? Or, uh, from Anne's Kitchen. From, from Anne's Kitchen. Kitchen. Okay, From Anne's Kitchen. I'm sorry I, I fluffed on that one. But, uh, and she has been a, a Franoi uh, contributor for. Uh, was it 25 years? Time goes by. Myself, 21 years. 21 years. And uh, uh, so uh, she's also, uh, in, in between time, had a professional career as a librarian. And uh, so uh, we, uh, we welcome you, and uh, we invite you to make uh, any kind of uh, statement that we haven't seen each other in a year or two. Well, I saw you at the, in, at the dinner for Joanne Serpico. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. That's the last time. That, yeah. um, maybe the last dinner dance for a period. Yeah. <laughs> Glad we went, yeah. Well, okay. you already introduced my, myself and my parents. And, of course, when you, before you came on, everyone was very excited to think we'll be talking about food. But I can speak about any one of those things. If you'd like more background about myself and my parents, I can start there. How we came to work in, the, in our jobs. Um, or we could just get to food questions or uh, whatever format you want. Dolores. Well, I should, maybe people would be most interested in hearing how my family came to write food columns for the front door. I can yeah. start with that. Um, my mother did it before me. She started in the 1970s, and I should back up a little to tell you how she probably got the job. My, as Nick, as uh, Dominic said, my parents were both very, very involved with the Joint Civic Committee of Italian America. Uh, first, my father's conception was one of the founders, and it was mostly men. And in the mid 60s, they decided there should be a woman who got to do and um, my mother was uh, pushed to the forefront by my father to work with this. And she immediately said, we don't want to be an auxiliary. We want to be an equal division. She was uh, standing up for women way, way back then. So it wasn't too long after they formed the women's division of the Joint Civic Committee of Italian Americans that uh, Fredway was already uh, published by uh, by the outreach of the little scout Reed. And Father Perini, who was the uh, leader of, the, of both the Ron Roy and the little scout Reed, approached my mother because she was a young, wonderful cook. And uh, Ken Jeremy said, I would love to teach even, not only Americans, but even our own Italian Americans, what it really means to eat Italian food. Everybody had this red checker tablecloth version of, the, of, of Italian dining. But he was very well aware of the culture and the cuisine of each region throughout Italy. And he wanted to showcase that. He wanted everyone to learn about each region individually. He wanted to hold one dinner a month or whatever schedule they could provide. 
and feature just one region and its cuisine, and then he would present the cultural program to go along with it. And uh, he would uh, take care of the, uh, this visual presentation or whatever form it took. But he wanted my mother to research and, and uh, prepare, not prepare, but present to the, to the combo and what the menu should be. So she started with Sicily because that's what she knew. She was a Sicilian and came from a long, long line of good Sicilian cooks. And uh, then she worked her way up the roof. But for some of these regions, she had absolutely no, I, you know, re recipes of her own from I mean, some of these remote, more remote regions. So she would guide us throughout the Chicago land community, trying to find women from each region, and she would ask them for the recipes. And if they said they didn't have any written down, she would go to their homes and follow them around in the kitchen, write on everything they did, and then she would test them at home. And when she had enough. Recipe she would present it to the come over and they would tell her which they thought they could prepare for a mass crowd. And they'd have these these evenings uh, in Italy. Uh, they did call them the cuisine culture. And they were so spectacularly popular. They were sold out every time. They ended up having to do three uh, three nights for each region. Uh, people were just clamoring for tea. And, uh, and with the the dinner, and we'll get a booklet talking about each of the recipes and all the recipes that my mother collected at Brett. Um, she couldn't feature that night. And um, it went on through all the regions. And like I said, in the 19th, it was so popular in the 1980s, people liked to bring it back, and they did it all over again, starting about 1984 or 85. And they, they did that again. So my mother had, besides her own wonderful family cooking and what she learned from all her relatives. She had this collection of all these recipes. And when the opening for a food editor came up at the front door, they asked her would she consider writing a food column. So that's how she started in the 1970s, writing for the front door. And she featured a lot of those recipes from the cuisine and culture dinners, and also sprinkled in her own family recipes and her friends' recipes and uh, uh, recipes from her readers. And she did that until she unexpectedly died in 1996. Uh, we were all stricken, and the whole community was stricken by it. And um, it wasn't too long. Well, after that, for a while, Paul just ran reruns of my mom's column. But at the beginning of the next year, he hired somebody else to write it. But that only lasted a little, little while. By uh, early 20. Uh, by early 2000, he approached me uh, with an idea that each month I could present, highlight one chapter from my mother's cookbook. Oh, I should tell you how the cookbook came to be written. First of all, um, during this time when someone else was writing the column, they were writing in a much less personal way. And they missed Anne. They, the readers missed Anne so in touch and her real cooks recipes and real Sicilian cooking and real Roman cook, uh, cooking, and et cetera. And so they kept calling up Paul Basil at the front door and said, we need Anne's recipe for Cucciagata. We need Anne's recipe for Canoli. You know, everybody still wanted the recipe. So then Paul asked me if he thought we could put together a cookbook. And uh, I didn't have much time to do it. Uh, it was the less than a year. And we came out in. I, I collected everything. Well, he wanted me to do all the, pro the recipes originally from the cuisine and culture dinners. But when I looked at them, they were not usable. They were very wonderful dinners. But these women would give recipes such as use a can of tomatoes and a glass of wine. And there's no amounts given. It would have taken me 14 years to test all those recipes, to write them down so that they were usable in a cookbook. So I said to Paul, what I could, I could do, what I can depend on and trust is my mother's own recipes and the recipes that she prepared in her own kitchen for other stores. And, and that's what we put together. And from about April of 1997, so we wanted it out by Christmas time. So it was sold in many uh, editions. I, mean, the, uh, I think his first one was about a thousand cookbooks. And I don't know how many more ones he had to print. 
for a long, long time. So especially as long as there are people who remembered my mother, which is getting to be not to many people anymore. So uh, in around 2000, he, he said, oh, he wanted to write it for the bottom line. And he said, why don't you take an, a, rest, a, a chapter each month and write an introduction to it? To the subject, whether it's entrees or uh, desserts or whatever, and then select uh, six or so recipes from that chapter. And when we finished doing that, he asked me if I would continue to do it, and I've been doing it ever since. And um, a couple of years ago, I actually passed up the number of years that my mother, my mother wrote for about 17 years for the time on, and now I've been doing it for the past uh, 20, 20 years. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm also anxious or willing to talk about my parents and their backgrounds if you're interested in that. If you're ever interested in uh, uh, doing another publication, uh, we'd love to help you. Uh, we have uh, learned uh, through uh, Jason uh, we figured out how to jump through all the hoops on Amazon, and we could publish a book on Amazon in a couple of weeks. If well, I don't know what, what market there would be for it. Like I said, the market for my mother's cookbook. My mother knew everybody in town. Yeah. <laughs> she, they, they, I'm going to tell you, they knew my mother. So there's a thousand, thousands of people who wanted those recipes. Although I've been doing this, most people don't know me. I don't go to meetings of the Joint Citizen Committee. I don't go to meetings of the Italian Cultural Center that often. I don't go to meetings of uh, the, um, or the Ghost Gallery and all those other things that my mother did. My mother and my father were out almost every night of the week at some kind of Italian function. And, and people who knew her personally wanted her cookbook. And um, I can walk clearly through any event of an Italian community and nobody will recognize me. Yeah, we, we did publishing things that uh, has, uh, uh, yeah, uh, in order to preserve them as much as anything else. Not necessarily. Just when you publish on Amazon, uh, it uh, goes to, uh, it's available as an ebook around the world and it's sold around the world and uh, uh, it, it's fairly. Uh, uh, inexpensive to uh, buy author's copies so that uh, uh, you can do a little bit of this. So if you'd ever like to do your collected uh, Brian Roy uh, articles uh, in a new book, uh, we'll be glad to uh, accommodate you. Or Jason does all the work, though, so uh, uh, we'll uh, schedule you with Jason if you're interested. But, uh, I remember your father and mother with a lot of admiration. Uh, your father was uh, uh, a, a scholar. Uh, he had a master's degree in sociology from the University of Chicago. And uh, he was a uh, uh, sort of, we'd call him a, a worker with the teenage games for a while. Uh, he had a position with the state in charge of juvenile uh, uh, matters uh, for a while. For many years. And he was uh, the uh, uh, steady uh, presence of the Joint Civic Committee of Italian Americans for, what was it, 30, 35 years? Well, it really goes back to the T Italian Welfare Council in the 1940s. Before there was the Joint Civic Committee of Italian Americans. I'm glad my father wrote this all down, by the way. Before it was in the Joint Civic Committee of Italian Americans, it was the Italian Welfare Council. And at that time, he was a very young man still studying sociology, and he was hired as a community worker in the old community where he grew up in Italy, and where there's still a lot of um, youth that not have any direction, and, and a lot of crime still. And they decided they should um, start something called the West Side Community Committee, try and help the youth and work with the people in the community and the youth from inside the community rather than have strange sociologists come in there and try to. So anyway, it was during that work that he met Frank and Daniel and a number of other people, Joe Salerno. Joe Salerno was the first, Joe Salerno was the father 
uh, the Joanne Superdome. So we go back and wait a long time. Our fathers were for the Italian Welfare Council. And um, he, Joseph Mann was the first president of that. And the, in some different ways, the Italian Welfare Council merged eventually into the Joint Civic Committee of Italian Americans. So that was actually formed in 1955, I believe. It became a, a it was maybe started a few years before it became a, a nonprofit organization registered with the state in 1975. And my father was always active, and for many years, uh, he was the executive director of uh, at the Joint Civic Committee of Italian Americans. At the same time that he was the executive director of the Illinois Commission on Delinquency Prevention. Well, that was a time when Italian American young people were at risk of becoming juvenile delinquents. Uh, they were involved in uh, neighborhood gangs and that sort of thing. And uh, there was a need for uh, some direction on the, uh, uh, on the basis of uh, having uh, sort of neighborhood young men leading or advising or uh, uh, seeing to the needs of uh, the uh, uh, young people in the community. You know, it was a community at risk. Uh, and that's a long ways from now. Uh, today, we have other ethnic groups in that situation, or seem to be in that situation. And uh, it's, uh, it's refreshing, I think, to uh, know that there was a time when uh, Italian youth were uh, in that situation, and it's also refreshing to know that they're not in that situation anymore. Yes. So your father was very successful. Yes, and he lived long enough to be able to say that. He, he understood, he lived until 20, uh, 2005, and during that time he saw how the, the problem of delinquency prevention changed, and he acknowledged that now that he had gone out of the kind of left up it would not be as easy to go into communities and solve the problems. So, and we're seeing that in the nightly news because, yeah. because you know, he had, at that time, but, but still, I have to say, I, when I hear the nightly news, I realize that a lot of the work that she, my father did under the direction of a famous sociologist named Clifford Shaw still is effective and still needs to be done. People still know to go into at-risk communities and, People have, in those communities have to solve the problem from within. We have a question from uh, Rosaria. Oh, thank you, Jason. I hope you can hear me. And hello, Dolores. Uh, it's so nice to hear you talking about the Italian community and um, the topic of food, which uh, keeps the Italian community together. I recall when I was a little girl, and uh, growing up in uh, Chicago, on Chicago South Side, I had some trouble actually uh, getting adapted to uh, Italian food because as an in-betweener, actually I was also inclined to eating American food, the junk food. The junk food. So, uh, you know, for a time I sort of felt out of place with my... Um, school friends and with my friends there, as you would say, on the road in the street, because I sort of felt like being part of the Adams family when they would say, well, what are you eating? What's that? <laughs> and it wasn't a hamburger and stuff like that. But nowadays, of course, there's a lot of talk about the Mediterranean diet, um, going back to Ansel Keys, and here we're even talking about the proper diet as a protection against COVID and coronavirus. And coronavirus. So my question was, no, my question as actually, as a kind of solidarity, how did you cope with being um, the daughter of Italians, but growing up in the American community and being sort of resilient, I suppose, to the uh, American so-called uh, diet or food? What was your relationship with it? Well, I can tell you my relationship. Uh, first of all, I understand what you're talking about. I, when I was sent to lunch, to work to school with lunch, I was the only one on Friday with a, a, 
Nossa, tá vendo? Eu tô atrás. Yeah, that's uh, something that I Thank recognized you. at one point, um, that uh, Italians have, uh, a, 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 even the poorest ones, have a, finally, a an advanced sense of hospitality. And uh, I recognized this uh, once when uh, my mother visited uh, Uh, the mother of uh, uh, a friend of mine who, uh, she was the wife of the superintendent of schools in town. And my mother came away from the, we were there for about an hour or so, my mother came away from it uh, insulted that uh, she had not had been offered anything at all, not even a drink of water. And uh, uh, I, 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 I had, I basically felt when I was a kid inferior to the uh, non Italians. I felt inferior because we were immigrants and outsiders and poor and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, but at that point, I got to thinking maybe there's something positive to uh, being <laughs> an Italian uh, and living in an Italian uh, uh, situation. Uh, so, That's a little sidelight from my experience. Well, um, my mother, like the hospitality reminded me, my mother fed everybody who came into her house. He could have been coming in to connect the telephone, but she would offer him something. There's no, there's no question. A lot of times they said yes, you know, but she, she didn't understand the idea of somebody was in her home and she didn't offer them something. Yeah. Oh. And what you said about being inferior, that described, my father talks about that at length in some of his earlier books. He felt extremely inferior to the point of feeling desolate and hopeless and didn't know what would become of his life until he, uh, when he did find his way. He was a shoeshine boy from Italy, the bloody, they call it the bloody 20th war, was the worst childhood you can imagine because he came here when he was six. And by the time he was nine, his father was very, very ill. And by the time he was 11, his father died. Yeah. We uh, included that story, uh, uh, an excerpt from his story, a biographical story, uh, in our Reconstructing Italians in Chicago. And uh, I uh, always think of the 1920s as a time when uh, Tony, as a little shoeshine boy, was running around the, the loop in the near west side, uh, shining shoes uh, and on his own, maybe with, with other boys, and uh, that was something. Yeah, 
He said that his sister, after his father died, his sister was two or three years old. I had to quit school and go and get a job. And he was, he made himself finish grammar school, but then he had to work. He had to work in every project. All of his education was at night school, high school, college, all of it. I mean, that's how I, I mean, I, I just almost, I just want to hug him when I think that he was just so per persistent, so confident. I mean, well, eventually he got confident. But he was just determined to be something besides the shoe shine way for the And, uh, yeah, he had to do that. He had to do that when his father died. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah he was uh, a great guy. I remember him uh, enjoying a cigar. Uh, from time to time, and uh, that was when he was in his uh, uh, period of contentment. Carol, do you have something to ask? Yes, I wanted, I wanted to mention something, so I've been muting and unmuting myself. Um, I, a couple of things about being Italian and eating the Italian diet, the Mediterranean diet. I grew up on the Mediterranean diet. I didn't grow up in Chicago. I grew up in Kenosha in an area of town that was called Little Italy. And everyone there was uh, had come from Italy. It was an area with uh, late migration from Italy to the U.S. before it was completely cut off. But anyhow, my mother would make me, I, so I lived in this bubble, so to speak, and my mother would make me these beautiful lunches and she prepared the food that, you know, we, we would really eat. So then, one day I was at my lunch, and when I was in middle school or junior high school at the time, and I kind of had left that bubble of culture, which was so wonderful. My whole family lived on the same block. I could, they could open, I could open the door to my parents' home, and my whole family was there, aunts, uncles, cousins. But when it came time to go to um, upper classes in school, I was in the lunchroom one day, and I opened up this lunch that my mother would make. She made it every day. I remember this so vividly because I say it really made me uh, inspired by going to the, to the profession that I'm in today. I opened the lunch. It was wrapped in wax paper, and the kids around, around me were not from my neighborhood. They were not Italians, and they looked at my lunch, and they couldn't identify what I was eating. In fact, they was... <laughs> joking about it. In fact, today it would be considered bullying. It was like every day when I would open my lunch, oh, let's see what she's got today. You know, this is the girl with the crazy lunches. And it was, you know, it was so typical of what my mother would pack for me. You know, it was uh, walnuts and dried apricots and she would make these beautiful cookies and put a piece of fruit in, a thermos with water. And I looked around the lunchroom and I saw all these peanut butter and jellies and um, Oreo cookies and processed foods. And I thought immediately that was the inspiration for me. You know, why do we eat like this? Because I was so proud of how we, we eat yet today. And why do other people eat like they do? And what does it do for our health? It was just um, always such a pride. And we didn't have a lot of money, although my father was a public official he was a, a supervisor, well, a supervisor in a, he took care of the Italian people. The Italian people needed something, they went to him and he made sure he would get to the courthouse and make sure it would happen. But um, I've always kind of straddled both worlds here in Italy. And one thing I will say in conclusion about Italy is we can talk about their high unemployment rate we can talk about the 22% unemployment rate in the south of Italy and feel so bad for them. But what I tell people when I do food classes is there are no food deserts in Italy. Everyone has a garden. People know how to grow food. They still have a relationship with food. My family plants practically everything that they, that they eat in Italy. And people don't have huge mortgages. They're not so worried about losing their homes because the homes have been passed down from generations. So it's such a beautiful culture. Um, it's such a gift. I've always felt that it's a gift I never probably deserved and was just lucky enough to be born into it. And um, I will say the Mediterranean diet is the most studied, the most copied, the most emulated in 
all across the world. So we have this wonderful gift that we continue to share. No, uh, my uh, uh, observation on this is that for 50 years, my parents had a gigantic garden, not only in the backyard, but there were victory gardens just outside of town in, in an area that has now become a dump. But at that time, it was the Victory Gardens area. And this was long after the World War II was over, but they kept the Victory Garden going. And for 50 years, they, they had mountains of tomatoes and all sorts of vegetables. Uh, uh, and celery at, uh, in the late fall, and we would have first celery growing in the basement at Christmas time. <laughs> And uh, they would make, uh, uh, my father would make wine in that period, uh, dozens and dozens of boxes of, uh, of wine uh, uh, grapes were in the basement that I used to make scooters with. And uh, they did for themselves in a way that brought them into the middle class. My father was a construction laborer, and in those days, those didn't work when there was bad weather. They couldn't work when there was bad weather. Now uh, it's a little bit easier to work in the winter time. So he was more or less unemployed in, in, the, in the winter time, um, straight through. But they moved into the middle class based on that. And I guess my father's uh, uh, pension as a, a laborer, even though the laborers union was the most corrupt around. Somehow he managed to get a, a pension of around $900 in the uh, 18, 1980s. Uh, and, uh, uh, that, that connection with, with food and with, the, uh, uh, with planting, with gardens, uh, made a difference, a sociological, a social class difference in my family's experience. Yeah. I just wanted to go back a bit to say but one of the things that I read when I, I look up a lot of material about the history of Italian, the history of Italian diet and the history of Italian food. And in Little Italy, uh, in the 20s or 30s, some group of sociologists, I think it was even earlier, some group of do-gooders came through to visit all the slum areas where the Italian children were uh, living, and they went into the homes to see what they could do to the school people. And they reported that to the authorities that the Italians were starving their children because they didn't have enough meat in their diet. Oh. Uh, that they were going to be malnourished because they ate only vegetables and pasta. And of course, we know a whole lot better now that, you know, meat should maybe with the smallest portion on your plate, right? Uh, uh, I just, I was just astounded when I read that, that there was a time when they were denigrating our diet. But people outside, those one of them who would come in there and tell the Italians how they should feed their children. Okay, let's go. We're running out of time. Let's go around the uh, clock here and see. Uh, who hasn't uh, asked a question? Uh, uh, Gloria Nardini, you're out there. I see you. And uh, I know you have a question. You always have a question. <laughs> Can't hear you, Gloria. Okay, now we can. Yes, yes. yes. No. no, I'm just, I just came into this, and it's interesting to me because, um, you know, we always ate that food too. <laughs> How lucky were we? Yeah, and it turns out to be the Mediterranean diet turns out to be the best thing in the whole world. I remember that um, there was an emphasis in my family on meat. And now, you know, uh, that isn't the case anymore. In Sicily, we didn't, my parents didn't have much meat. They were both from Sicily, and they were reported that they didn't have any opportunity to eat. Okay, uh, uh, Jeanette, you're standing, sitting there, tight lip. Yeah, I uh, 
excuse me, I had to leave for a few minutes because I had some workmen at my house. But it was funny that you mentioned about we always offer things to our guests and our workmen. My, my father was an electrical contractor. And whenever we had anybody at our house, even to pay a bill or to visit, we always had them sit down and have a, not just a drink, the rest of the meal with everybody else. So when these guys were here, I water, coffee, whatever they wanted, and they wound up asking for a, bottle, a container of ice. So that was all I could give them. But I said, it's tacky when you go to someone's house and they don't even ask you to sit down, let alone give you a glass <laughs> of water. So I mean, we're very, uh, as Italians, we're used to being generous and we don't think anything of giving somebody something. We're, it's just part of our hospitality. As Dominic said, we don't think that it's an an imposition to give somebody a glass of water. Come in, sit down. You know, it's the newspaper lady. Oh, here, <laughs> let me give you something. But uh, I have to back uh, the lunches for school. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, we live three blocks from St. Anthony, so we didn't get to have lunch in a uh, in a lunch box. We, my brother and I, had lunch boxes. We never took them to school because. We never ate at school. We just walked home for the three blocks and had to eat at home. You know, what's the matter? You don't eat at home? <laughs> we had to eat at home. And my parents were both born here, so we weren't, uh, you know, not of the immigrant old fashioned, but my mom cooked us lunch or made us a nice lunch every single day. And if she had an appointment at lunchtime, we got a quarter in our handkerchief tied up in the corn. And we thought that was a big deal to have lunch at school. <laughs> Because <laughs> we always ate at home. And yes, it only so I Yeah, I hate to say this. I remember in kindergarten, she gave me three pennies for the milk. It was a half a pint of milk, and it was three pennies in those days. So God knows how old that was. But, I mean, we didn't walk around with big uh, salami sandwiches and whatever, because we ate at home. <laughs> we did not eat out Jeanette, I, so my mom was one of them, so we just didn't. <laughs> Carol, I Carol, just was going to say, I, I, Jeanette's comments are so right on because even if we had somebody come to yeah. fix a TV or work at the house, my dad would make them stay for dinner, you know, or, or if it was during the day to have something to eat. So typical, so giving. I love it. Set up. Set up. Can I ask Carol a question? Well, there's a question here? Who, who's that? I asked, I wanted to know, oh. Carol spoke of her, the, the, her uh, relationship to Mediterranean food and how it became her life's work, and I was wondering what work she does. Oh, I'm a, a licensed nutritionist, and so I'm always, yeah, trying to get people to emulate that Mediterranean diet and not a lot of meat, especially the meat today. Yeah. Well, that's good. Uh, that's uh, in keeping with uh, your uh, upbringing, and you professionalized it, and uh, uh, that's, uh, you look back and, into the culture, and it gives you a, a lot of depth into, and, and experience into uh, the profession that you chose. I feel the same way. I spent my time, last 45 years, uh, doing Italian American studies, and uh, it's uh, it's just remembering what I grew up with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thanks everyone. Does anybody have any announcement or whatever for uh, the rest of the group? Okay. Uh, well, we'll see you next week and. Uh, we thank Dolores. Uh, Dolores, we don't see you enough or hear from you enough. Uh, don't be so uh, uh, sparse. Uh, uh, stay in touch. And so, so long, everybody. Ciao, Domenico. Arrivederci, Gloria, Dominic, Jeanette, Dolores, Carol. Vi aspetto a Roma. Arrivederci. Ciao. Bye, Gloria. Nice to see you. Look good. Ciao. Ciao.